Yeah, well, yeah, yeah he uses Tor. Didn't, isn't, didn't Snowden use Tails to do all his, uh, I don't know. I think so. Right. I, yeah. I thought yeah. I read that. To do his criminal activity. So I think those guys figured, we've arrived, and that's why they probably jumped yeah. to 1.0. So. Oh, one thing to note, too, with Tails, um, they've got a, kind of a list of known issues, and uh, apparently uh, if, you, if you try to use the uh, Acer Chromebook, I'll, I'll like it. The C Acer Chromebook. <laughs> is that the C720? Yeah. No, it's the 710. It's last year's model. All right. Apparently, um, the, the booting will fail with a not enough memory to load specified image. So there's a workaround if you change to... Uh, uh, I'm surprised they can live boot it at all. Mm -hmm. Mine's so locked down, I can't live boot a Linux distro at all. Well, this is the 720, so you must have gotten a version that doesn't allow the live boot. <laughs> No, a lot of Chromebooks don't allow it at all. Chromebooks are really locked down. Yeah. Anyway, but they do have a workaround for that. You just simply add mem equals 1500m space boot. And according to the site, anyway. All right. We're actually taking around on the first, May 1st, the Nixons. Nixos. Nixos. 14.04. And I tried reading up on this because it looked interesting. They have an interesting logo, um, but I I didn't see anything that really stood out. To me. I don't know. Well, uh, you know, one thing they uh, actually what you should do the, uh, from the website you can download a, uh, a virtual uh, box uh, image, and I did that. I uh, I booted it up. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more looking looking at it, but I haven't um, uh, done that yet. However. Uh, for this particular release, uh, GNOME 3.10, uh, some experimental support for GNOME 3.10 has been added. And uh, experimental because they're made yeah. the desktop is KDE, right? Uh, yes, that's yeah. that's correct. It's KDE. And but they've also updated it to the very latest system D. Mm -hmm. That's another big thing. So we've got to start right. the new system D. Yeah, and the, um, what they've done also too is they they um, Release is now with the fire uh, firewall enabled by default, but Adobe Flash Player is not enabled by default. So I'm not. Why are, is anybody still use? Raise your hand if you still use Adobe Flash Player at all. Oh, yeah. um, Outside of Chrome, because inside Chrome it's not the regular Flash Player. It's Pepper. No, no, I, I a YouTube okay. video this morning. YouTube I, is using HTML5. No, it it said that uh, Flash crashed and. I've seen it's that like I thought uh, it was using HTML5 and it said flash crash. I'm wondering if it was, maybe it's an old uh, video or something. So, yeah. Anyway. Oh, well. Well, most I of the people in our audience are still using flash, so I stand corrected and I'll still say stop using it. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. All right, moving on. We have a BSD release. I'm open BSD 5.5. Um, and it's in now in 64 bits on all platforms. Yeah. That's right, and of course all remember, platforms with 64 bit. Yeah, because <laughs> because yeah. OpenBSD is still supported on VAX. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course those guys are the security kind of yes. guys. And whenever they release, they always have a little song, and you'll be hearing it later. Yeah, it is our. Okay. It's our outro. It's going to be our outro music. Yep. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. All right, uh, we have Open and Riva. LX, working at zero, uh, which right. is the latest to stable update Phosphorus. for your customized KDE desktop. What is it called? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. That's right. And uh, I went off to the website, and what they've said there, they said uh, it's taken from the Greek word uh, meaning, uh, the Greek word for light bringer. So that's the, their hope for the word. But one thing um, they, they've got available here, it's the first release of Open Mandriva LX that incorporates support for uh, EF, uh, EFI Google. So, you, yeah. yeah, so you you be, you'll be able to do that. Um, but they said, the little caveat, they've done limited testing, so, uh, they, and they welcome your feedback well, if you run into problems. And what else they've done is they have uh, uh, souped up 3.1, 3.11 kernel in there, which has been super customized to provide excellent system performance in a desktop environment. And um, they, uh, they also transitioned from ISQL to MariaDB. So they said 
They said it may break some applications, but uh, it's it's still sure compatible. It's not really good. Yeah. yeah. Well, they do, but they didn't issue a caution well, on the website. Yeah, they have to just because they're switching, but it's. But yet again, another one with solar. Well, Red Hat did too. Is well, it's in the works, and and seven O Maria DB is going to be the default database. Yeah. I wonder what we're because then it'll be a setup. So I wonder what we're going to do at work. Mm. Yeah, that's a lot of because we've tuned we've tuned MySQL hard. We can just keep using it. So I know. Yeah, Oracle will support you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. all right, all right. Last on our list released yesterday. You know, Friday the third was uh, Solid XK twenty fourteen oh five. The third was yesterday. I guess it was. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, in Solid XK, the X and K stands for XFCE and KDE. Mm -hmm. So you can get the, um, you can install it either way. Yeah. You looked into that a little bit, didn't you, one of your reviews, Mary? I did, I did. And what I, I liked about uh, this particular distro is, is that they've got three flavors of it. I mean, and we're not talking desktop environments, we're really talking. Uh, uh, use cases. They've got kind of a home version, they've got more of an enterprise, and they've got something called back office. And it's designed for kind of uh, uh, nonprofits and other similarly situated entities. And they include, uh, uh, there's like an invoice, invoicing system, they've got a uh, uh, human resource management system, just a number of different things. And uh, their website has further information about it, but I Oh, I took a look at a couple of those apps. It's really nice. Uh, doc, there's a document management system oh, that's, that's available. Cool. Yeah, for that. So, I mean, you can get these particular applications separately and then incorporate them into another distro, of course. But what they've done is they've just identified this whole palette for you, um, kind of to make that job a little easier. All right. All right. And then we're on to the top five. Of you. Okay. And number five, we have Tails. Wait, wait, wait. I was scrolling on the bucket. With 1813. And? And trending up. And number four, we have Voyager with 1874. And trending up. And number three is Debian with 2344. And trending up. And number two is Ubuntu with 2390. And trending down. And in the number one spot is Mint. Gotta love that Minty goodness. With 2906 and turning down. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's something that we talk about every Back once in a while that these, these uh, top five that we, it's, it's just kind of a fun thing to look at. You know, it's, it doesn't it's really not, mean anything. Yeah, it no. doesn't mean anything like for being the popularity of, of Linux, what distro is better than the other. It's just something that uh, DistroWatch puts on there, and that's how many people have actually clicked on their page for each of these distros. So it's, it's something fun I like to look at and you talk about, but, uh, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the end of the distros, and I saw a couple of people walk in while we were uh, talking, so I want to say hi to everybody. Yep. I know Gib walked in, and I, I don't remember, right and I don't think I've seen you before. Uh, what's your name? Me? Yeah. She uh, was so I'm, anonymous, I'm so. Randy Yunus. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, welcome. welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, so. We should do a. We should have them do a. It's a lot. They give us trivia. Do Linux trivia questions. Yeah, later. stump the panel. Stump the panel. <laughs> Linux trivia. Sure. We've got a list Fire of questions. Fire your Google up and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. All right. So next up is. Uh, uh, Alright, yeah, so what am I reviewing this week? Actually, I'm, I've got a couple of things I want to talk about. One is Vortex Box. You, uh, you'll recall that on our last episode, that was one of the um, distros that had a release, had a distribution release. And so I, of course, I would say, oh, no, I'm going to have to try it. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to try it, and I did. So I downloaded the uh, distro, and I've got a uh, old Dell computer that serves as kind of a media center for me. And actually, all I did is just ran and stopped with YouTube, and I had it uh, hooked up to my television. <coughs> I had a um, Ethernet cable in the back coming directly from my router. So I just thought, you know, I'm going to take that off and give it a try and see what happens. So I did. 
And what I didn't realize, uh, because I, you know, I didn't read the instructions. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how it is. You just instructions. What are those? I was figuring. I was figuring, um, and maybe it's there, but um, StartX did not produce it. Uh, it basically installs. It's basically a headless server, as far as I can tell, media server. And what you do is, it will generate an IP address, and then you just take another computer that's on the network. You browse to that uh, IP address, and there's the whole configuration setting of, uh, oh, yeah. dashboard there. So yeah, I've got that. What's nice about it is that uh, the Vortex box lists Logitech's media server as one of the protocols that it supports, and I happen to have a Logitech squeeze box radio upstairs. Yeah. So it's really cool because once I got, I had to get them all. I had to get the accounts kind of set up and get them all on the same uh, network. And uh, once I got that taken care of, then I could, from downstairs, I could go ahead and um, pre uh, set up, program what I wanted to play on the radio upstairs. And I had the radio turned up, and sure enough, the radio upstairs changed and started playing whatever I had uh, put on there. I mean, it's really nice because they've got TuneIn, and um, those of you who maybe use the mobile version of it, TuneIn is basically a radio app. It's available on the Android uh, Google Play. Oh, yeah. iOS, yeah, I, I've got it, and I've listened to local radio stations, and you can set it up that way. So, so. tune in, we'll grab, we'll connect to your Logitech media server? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I've, I've been I, looking for one for my phone. Yeah, I, um, you can, what I did is I ended up playing some radio stations upstairs off my uh, Logitech radio. Okay. From that. Yeah, so, so I was, uh, you know, Vortex Box, oh, by the way, too, it's based on Fedora, and I do have to oh. say this. <laughs> uh, those of you who listen to this podcast on a regular basis know that I kind of ripped uh, that installer Anaconda. Mary doesn't like Anaconda. Oh, it's it's kind of just because she's Fedora's fine. Once you get past the Anaconda partitioning situation, it's it's, it's a, an excellent installer. It's fine. It was totally user the user error. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to mention about uh, this particular version is that um, as long as you get your partition set up ahead of time, um, it, this, uh, it, the installer for Vortex Bots takes you right through it without really much of a, a problem at all. And then I did notice, now the, um, the most recent Fedora release is called what, Heisenberg? Heisenberg. Well, it said, welcome to Heisenberg. <laughs> now, I, I'm thinking, now, did the Vortex people just do that as a joke, or is that really a typo? I'm sure they did it as, so, as a I joke. laughed when I saw it, but that was really the only problem. Not, it wasn't even a problem. It was actually kind of funny. But anyway, so uh, that was just my little um, two cents worth regarding Vortex Box. Again, I, I run it at home now, and I, I like it. I mean, maybe I'll find something better, but uh, for right now, it works just fine. And I'm going to be hooking up, uh, I've got a couple of external hard drives, about 500 gigs worth of music and all sorts of other stuff. I'm going to be hooking that up and uh, streaming that through this uh, organization. Media service are cool stuff. Oh my goodness. That, that latch that music server, I had that running in my house for three, almost four years. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Um, I, and you don't have to have a, a Logitech piece of hardware to run it. I think we talked a little bit about it last week. Um, they have uh, apps you can run. There's a command line app, and then there's a Java app that you can program you can run it on your uh, your desktop, and that you can either run it on your local home uh, network, or if you're away, like when I was at work, mm -hmm. you all you have to do is open up an SSH port to your server that's running it, and the um, the Java app will automatically uh, do the SSH tunnel in and connect to yours and start streaming all your music that you have at home. Uh, or what you have set up on your new, your mm -hmm. server, and then you can do the same thing with your command line, set up the tunnel, and then start up the, uh, the command line. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's really cool. It was pretty slick, so I'm, I'm enjoying that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so instead of just uh, running a stock uh, distro, I, well, I guess it is stock vortex lines, but it's, it's nice. Cool. So anyway, I wanted to chat about that. The only thing I want to chat about as far as distro reviews is Gobo Linux. Now, um, Gobo Linux has been around for a long time, um, but it went on hiatus from 2008 until I think late last year when it started, when it released its first alpha. And um, uh, in April, it released two betas. So I thought, um, or actually, I think it released its first beta in January, its second beta in April, early April, around the 7th or 8th, and I thought, you know, I'm going to take a look at it, once a distro gets to its second beta, I kind of think it should be polished enough to 
even though it's a beta, you can look at it, <laughs> evaluate it, review it. Um, Not so. Well, <laughs> anyway, so, and normally I don't do reviews of beta versions. However, when a distro has an unusual aspect to it, I'm willing to check it out. Uh, those of you who are regular listeners know I, I looked at Cubes OS, which is that just security conscious. There's a silo. Really like. Totally yeah, silo. silo. I mean, it, it runs on a Zen hypervisor, and you have all these various little uh, little uh, virtual machines that, that are connected, but you've got to kind of... Does it use virtual machines or containers? I thought it used containers. Um, they probably are containers. Uh, I guess I use the term virtual machine in kind of a broad, not... <laughs> but anyway, uh, so today's distro characterizes itself as an alternative Linux distribution. So how alternative is it? Well, it has completely redefined the entire file system hierarchy. Boo, done, that's it. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Oh, wait a second, though. Yeah. So, so running ls from the command line is only going to show you six directories. Six, sorry. I weighed five fingers in. Which is better than the one finger you weighed in me a couple times. But anyway, um, the stalwarts such as, such as Etsy and Dev and Var are nowhere to be seen. What? That's yeah. done. So, don't, even, don't even go any further. So. Well, then, then goes my repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. No, so, so would this pared down structure mean that I've arrived at distro nirvana? Or would I spin in a new version of dependency hell? Oh my God. <laughs> Let's find out. Well, first of all, the vitals, global Linux. Uh, the maintainer that's a group of uh, developers, uh, it's actually based out of Brazil. By the way, did you guys see that news article on the uh, Olympics? That they are yes. far behind? It's a little scary. It's because down in Brazil, I think they just well, like they put a, they put a ton into the World Cup. They're doing the World Cup this year. Yeah, I heard. That, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But anyway, so but uh, Google Linux, uh, this most recent recent uh, beta release runs uh, the 3.13 kernel, and uh, the review desktop. Well, actually, there are two. I started off with the second beta, and that had KDE just by default, and then I ended up switching to the third beta, and we'll find out why in a few minutes. And that had Enlightenment 17 on it. Now the, the live environment, um, in the live environment you've got a, Firefox is a default browser that has no office suite, it has no mail client, you're up to installing those yourself. And the file manager, well of course when I was looking at it in KDE it was Dolphin, but in uh, Enlightenment it's the Enlightenment file manager. One thing I discovered too is when I needed to do some, uh, I wanted to do some checking of things using a terminal, and unfortunately I didn't. I saw, the, I saw this entry terminology and I thought that would just be Google Linux terminology. No, this is a ter it's a terminal, it's a terminal called terminology. Yeah, it took it's, me a it's a very different kind of terminal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so I'm going to first run through the install process. Um, when, uh, when, I, when you install it, you've got uh, some meager choices as far as how you want your uh, uh, partitions formatted. You've got ext2, 3, or 4. So um, I picked 4 because that was the biggest number. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the next uh, the next screen displays three package options. You can you can install the base option, which is basically requires only one gig of storage on your system. The typical option, 1.3, and then what's called the full option, which is two gigs. And then there's a window below that will show you exactly what's going to be installed with each option. Um, so you can go through and again, this is an NCurses install. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, think of a Debian install where you've got those you know, about four different colors and you've got to kind of tap. And you hit enter or you hit tab or you know it's it's is, a real install. It's in other very words. rudimentary. Oh, but it's 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 effective. I mean, you know, you just you get to the chase. But anyway, so um, it asked me several questions, including um, uh, whether I wanted to add an additional user in addition to the root user, and I said yes, of course, and I supplied that information. Um, and then I also enabled super user privileges for that user so that I could then use sudo if I wanted to, apparently. Uh, and interestingly enough, you think that bash was going to be the default shell in Google Linux? Wrong. It's ZSH. Yeah, ZSH is getting real popular. There's uh, the one guy at work, uh, is a big ZSH user. He actually contributes to the ZSH uh, project, and uh, he wanted to make it his default shell. But the guy in charge of like pushing that out through Puppet told him he couldn't make it his default shell <laughs> because we have a bunch of Nexus functions okay, that, so and they're they're tested in Bash, tested working in Bash. 
but not ZSH. They told him he couldn't use it as his default shell. Yeah, well, ZSH is also the default in uh, PCBSD. Yeah, well, so yeah. I added, well, I installed Bash and fed my uh, app, and, or put it in my, as as default, my default shell, shell yeah, in that profile. So anyway, but uh, now as, it, as the uh, um, install progressed, it's kind of interesting because what really caught my eye is the fact that uh, there was line after line after line of installing program and then the name of the program, installing program, name of the program. And we're going to talk about why that is in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and then that was followed up by what are called the post-install scripts. And by the way, Global Linux uses Grub, so I was kind of happy to see that. I mean, yeah, Lilo's okay, but not many distros use it anymore. Well, Slackware is the only distro I know that is actively using Lilo. Mm -hmm. So, now, what was interesting is in the beta 2, when I uh, booted to the install environment, it had a few interesting moments because as Google Linux booted, each successful step was met with a screen update that said, yes, hey, it works. <laughs> Print it out on the screen. And then it said, Yahoo, and an exclamation point. So you'd see this one after another, and I got kind of a kick out of that. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, when I tried the beta 3, uh, all of that was gone. <laughs> <laughs> but it booted a lot faster because it was booting into a yeah, Lightroom yeah. 17. So maybe they were just doing that for entertainment purposes. But I have to admit, I was a little entertained by it. Um, no, once you, um, going, going from zero to desktop is a manual process. First, you boot to a login prompt or a login screen, and you've got to, uh, uh, it'll present you with the system information, and then there's your login prompt. So you need to log in, and then typing start X, of course, is going to fire up the X server and get you going and give you your desktop. So that's a little something that it's not automatic. You've got to do it yourself. And that's not a big deal um, because Google Linux is not designed for new people. So they said in their FAQ. <laughs> they um, made it known, yeah. not noob friendly. Yep. And uh, by the way, too, it's usually when you think about installing a distro, usually you've got about uh, four or five standard default folders in your home directory. Global Linux just gives you one desktop. That's it. There's no documents folder, no uh, pictures. Or first, folders. first they f with the file hierarchy. Yeah, then, then they, they screw around with my home directory. Well, I'm not going with Global Linux anytime in the near future. It, it irritated me when. Uh, Red Hat decided to do away with user bin and use, I mean, with S bin and, and, and bin and symlink them to user bin and user S bin. That was bad enough. Well, yeah, so, so but anyway, but with these guys, so, uh, and the reason why, and I said they went from beta 2 to beta 3 fairly quickly because I could not, when I tried to get out to the internet, um, I had some problems getting out to the internet. And not only that, but whenever I open Dolphin, because keep in mind that Beta 2 used KDE, and I think one of the reasons why they switched is because they have an open bug in their bug tracker for probably for about six months. You get this cannot find mind types, inode forward slash directory, inode forward slash block device, inode forward slash uh, care device, C-H-A-R device? Character. Character device, yeah. I like I was pulling the data. But anyway, so every time I opened Dolphin, um, it couldn't find this stuff, but I could still get into some things. And they said they haven't been able to figure out why it's doing that. So they figured, well, our workaround is we'll switch to Enlightenment 17. <laughs> we'll switch to beta. So that's what they did. Now, I said earlier that Global Linux consists of six directories. You've got data, you've got your lost and found, data, mounts, data. Who has ever heard of a data directory in the Linux file system hierarchy? Exactly. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I am just telling you. Listen, I go through this pain so you don't have to. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so they then had um, uh, mount programs and system and users. One oh, interesting. Well, listen. One interesting thing. Users. Uh, no. Instead of home, instead of slash home, they call it slash users. Yeah. I'm telling you. And inside inside the users, they had uh, the root user. Uh, instead of in slash root? Instead of his own, instead of, oh, instead of his own, it was inside there. Yeah, so no. The pain, oh, the pain. But they, well, no, I wasn't even annoyed by that. Man. <laughs> Here's what annoyed me, is that they use, um, they use camel case for their directories. So they're, they're not all lowercase. You've got, uh, oh, my. for their directories and different things that you need to do. So camel retarded. Case. So. They're just shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. This this door is going to go nowhere. <laughs> so, but if um, so, anyway, we'll talk about programs. So, if you want to see what's installed, you look at this directory because the what 
here's why they do this. All of the legacy Unix directory structure is there. They have got a script that hides it. It's called Gobo Hide. So you can do Gobo Hide. Oh, because that's a good thing. What? <laughs> <laughs> they believe so. Through a utility called Gobo Hide, you can toggle a directory on and off. So Matt, you can turn all of the legacy directories on. Okay, but if I install a real distribution, yeah. oh, they're all just there. I don't got to turn anything on or off. Well, that is true. That is true. Don't keep the message in there. Um, but anyway, so so they've done this because they just wanted to simplify things, but they also um, also want to be create a way in order. For example, if you're going to search for something, uh, the system director is basically full of symlinks to the actual programs in the program directory. Now, the program directory allows you um, all of the uh, files that are needed for a particular program are contained there. So you can install more than one version of a program. Say, for example, GIMP. You can install every version of GIMP available, and they've got them in what are called recipes. Uh, their recipes are basically uh, consists of the files and other things that you need in order to run that program. And they've got, um, they've got a, a, a program called, or it's called actually compile. It's not a program. It's really just a... It's a method for installing. And it will run uh, these recipes to install software that you've designated. Now these recipes are scripts that will download source tarballs. They'll unpack, compile, and install them. I tested it. And I installed Jack, uh, you know, the audio um, user uh, console control, that little Jack, Jack control. Yeah. I installed that. Uh, I was able to install. Um, but then were you to get, able to get Jack configured and run it? <laughs> Do I look like an audio engineer? No. Uh, I was only testing to see if I could install it. Because actually, um, I did have some problems installing a few things. Um, they said, as long as, I, as long as the recipe is in their repository and all dependencies can be satisfied, you'll end up with a nice souffle. Otherwise, you'll get burned by the stove. I experienced both. I was able to successfully install some things. And then I ended up uh, with some unsatisfied dependencies, either because the thing was so old that I couldn't find a dependency, or could, you know the system couldn't satisfy it. So you know, again, you can you can do it, but um, it's kind of a crapshoot. Sounds like a half baked package manager. Half baked, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And because uh, you know, because of this directory structure, again, as I said, you can install multiple versions. So um, anyway, I, so my. I'm not even going to rate this because it's not, it hasn't come out as a final version. I'll rate it for you, negative two. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, yeah, I found Global Linux to be kind of interesting in some ways. I wasn't at all impressed, I was not at all impressed with Enlightenment 17 as far as how they implemented it because... Um, Enlightenment it's a pretty decent desktop. I, I, I like it. I, I think it's an older version. And I no, think 17, I think, is the current version. Is it? Okay. Well, I think they kind of slapped it on there because of the KDE mess that they had in, in uh, the second beta. But anyway, it was, uh, I found it to be kind of an interesting um, system for at least experimentation. Certainly, it would not be a production level system for me, but you know me, I, I kind of like this stuff polished and finalized. So, anyway, but that's Global Linux. Uh, just a different, different distro. Yeah, all right. Different is right. It was. <laughs> Very different. All right. I think we should keep the news short since we only have about 15 minutes left. I only have two things for me. Okay. I got a couple. Cool. Yeah, I didn't I didn't find anything, so it's not perfect. <laughs> All right, so the news. So Matt, did you find anything? I did find anything. <laughs> and I'm mildly retarded. <laughs> I did find something. Uh, at IT World, they have a story on Google Deals made Android phones more expensive lawsuit claims. There was a lawsuit filed on Thursday that accuses Google of strong arming device manufacturers into making its search engine the default on Android devices, driving up the cost of those devices and hurting consumers. The consumer class action complaint filed in the U.S. District Court of Northern District of California alleges Google does, does that by making secret agreements with manufacturers that also require applications such as YouTube and Google Play Store to occupy the prime real estate on the device's screens. 
hasn't Microsoft been doing this kind of crap forever though? Yes. So yeah, yeah, yeah you see those little stickers saying approved for whatever yeah. Windows. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know, I don't I don't see the big deal. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I'm not a Google fanboy or anything, I swear. Okay. And then I also got this other one was just kinda neat. If you go to uh, I'm not gonna read the URL, if you just Google for Intel password checker. It's kind of a nifty website. It's got a